Crosley Church in Kent. The first point visited in the field trip of the London Earth Mysteries Circle and Surrey Earth Mysteries Group in August 1989. This church is famous for being on a lay mentioned by Paul Devereux on television. This lay passes through this church to the Coldrum Long Barrow and then to Snodland Church. Here we see another stone in the foundations next to a very modern flint wall. The interior of Trotsley Church showing the pulpit which came from Westminster Abbey sometime during the 19th century. Chamber Barrow. Um, it's a classic example of Medway type of chamber tomb. Um, it's excavated in 1910 uh, by Sir Arthur Keith and it was found to have 22 skeletons here plus some, some infants. Um, one of the skulls was obviously um, accorded a lot more importance than the other and was um, put on a little shelf of its own so you can imagine a, a chieftain or somebody probably that kind of a spell. Uh, it did have a dividing stone in the middle, a sexual stone, and um, there was a semicircular hole going between the, the two, so a sort of a porthole between the two. Um, there was also a flint sickle found and some uh, rather crude pottery. Um, most of them, the remains are in the Maidstone um, Museum, if you want to find it. Um, this stone circle you see round it, um, called the Perry Stale, um, was basically a retaining wall. And uh, the mound was approximately D-shaped, as you can see it now. Um, if you look down here, you can see the other half of the chamber, which unfortunately slid down the slope. And the reason for this was because of a chalk quarrying the early part of last century. Um, there was a natural terrace here, so this was, was on a good lookout here. It dropped down naturally, but unfortunately they've eroded away and it slid down the slope there. Um, it's mainly more or less covered over with earth. It was a very good lookout. The main axis, as you can see, is um, east-west, which was um, quite a classic alignment. Besides. Did you say you can see Kit's Coty from here? Uh, somebody was saying that. I don't know what precise direction that is. It is on the high ground over there, so I'm not sure the exact spot it might. I think it would definitely be, be hidden by trees, because it is just beside a line of trees over there, so 
we might indeed have difficulty actually pinpointing it. That's the other side of the river. three and a half miles. Um, that's where the lay ends up. So it goes through here, goes through a pond, goes to Snodden Church, uh, the, uh, the way across the river there, there's the falls there, and goes on to Bareham Falls. So it's about three and a half miles long, I believe. Yes. And there was a legend of a tunnel to that's the church. Right. The, the tunnel runs, well, the, 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 the legend says it runs from the Long to Bareham over to the church. And um, do you want me to go through the... Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, the story is that um, two brothers heard about this and wanted to test where the tunnel might lead to. And um, so they decided the best way to do it, one of them was to walk along the top, and one of them was to actually go along the tunnel. So the, the brother who went through the tunnel played his pipe, and his brother above him was able to locate him below by following along the top. But unfortunately, they got about halfway, and all of a sudden the uh, piping stopped, unfortunately brother was never found. That's a sort of sad end to it. Um, probably um, shows you that uh, you know it was more of a legend than a tunnel itself because there seems to be no entrance. To it. But um, as you know, these tunnel tunnel legends usually fall on on ley lines. So yes, yes. It's a folk memory of that time. Stopped at a level crossing in Aylesford and saw this lovely little clump of Scots pines.
direction of Coldrum Long Barrow. This was probably originally the capstone of Lower Kitts Coty. Which until the hurricane stood in a small grove of trees. These fields were full of oyster shells dating from the time of the Roman occupation. Another clump at Aylesford. Probably the entrance stone okay. of the Addington Long Barrow. Now a road cuts diagonally across the barrow, cutting a furrow right across it. Stone slabs on both sides of the mound, 
No burials or other discoveries have been recorded from this barrow. Likely dates circa 2500 2500 BC. And it says its resemblance in plan to North German and Dutch tombs of slightly later date should be noted. That's, that's all it's got down here. Chestnut's burial chamber at the home of Mrs. Bygraves. And one. Um, it's a flint nodule that's been picked, picked up with those bits taken off and shaped on that edge, so that's been used like that. And you can see that that's got all the little indentations where it's been blunted. They were sensible enough to give themselves a, a thumb plate so they could cushion the shock. And this has probably been that shape like that, but it's become dented where it's been um, blunted, where it's been used like that continually. But that's easy. nice to feel your fingers on that and feel it. And this one, once again, very nice thumb plate there and very badly dented there where it's been used. Turned and slightly used there, but one side is still quite pristine, so you've got the, uh, the series of use there. Um, you might like to come a bit closer because these all got sort of um, different jobs. These, this is a group of blades that I found, and they've all got different jobs. That's it. They relieve yourselves all these lumps oh, of stone. Yes. Oh, yes, certainly. Right. Pass it yeah, if anybody wants to look, yeah. come on in. Come on. <laughs> come on. <laughs> there we are. This is, this is a chisel. You, you see, it's perfectly shaped at that end there. It's almost transparent. There we are. Oh. This is a borer for making holes from things, still very sharp tip. Uh, this one combines two cutting edges as well as a bore, boring end. So you're starting to get multi-use bits of stone. This one has a lovely little chamfered edge. Uh, if you stroke that very gently on your hand, you'll find it's a lovely little bit of action. That and this one is what is known as a blade. It's got the two cutting edges, so it could be set in and reused on one side first and then taken out and reused that way. But you can imagine that in a curved piece of wood, you could set four or five of those together and then you've got yourself your hand sickle or in a straight piece of wood, you've got a long blade. So this was a very useful shape and very much used. And I think that they obviously used them in different sizes because I found this as a fragment, which is obviously a much larger version of this. And the Museum of London at the Barbican found one of these about so long in the Thames, and they have set it into a piece of wood like that to show you how it could be used as a little primitive hoe for dragging through roots of things. So that was a very useful um, tool. If anybody wants to see anything particular, give a shout and change in motion. Thank you, it can be. <laughs> we don't really know whether they, whether they um, did anything much with body here at all. They probably did, because it's usually a form of decorating in some way to flatten or paint or cut or do something. Um, then this is known as an arrow tip, but in actual fact it's more like a spear tip to our way of thinking. And if you look sideways, you can see that it's shaped, which means it's meant to be set in at that point there. So that has been set into the end of a piece of wood. It's lost its point here. More like a, um, a spear tip to our way of thinking. But you could use that by itself or else in conjunction with a shape like this. These are known as projectile tips, projectile for throwing, and the Egyptian records, which have much better written records than we have, and pictures as well, show them standing in the marshes with these on the ends of pieces of wood, and as something went waddling or wading by, it was much a, a question of waiting patiently and then a sort of a stun stab action in order to get your dinner. So you could put several bits together and use them in conjunction with one another, or equally, you could have that at the end of a piece of wood and several pairs uh, of, of this shape down the side and by about, putting, by about seven bits put together, you'd make your, yourself a harpoon. So you could stand patiently and wait for dinner to come by and then if you were lucky, you, you um, struck. Um, 
this is a very interesting one. It's almost like a claw. Someone's seen what animals do with claws and has made himself a little claw. And it's stepped there once again, which tells you it was meant to be set on the end of a piece of wood for like a little rake. But that's quite a charming little one, if anybody would like to look at that. It shows how they were looking at nature and seeing how nature coped with life so that they could translate it into their own everyday way of living. Um, these are interesting stones, densely fractured, which, which means that they were in and out of different temperatures very rapidly. Um, um, those stones were used by in the following way. They couldn't put their pots of clay on the fire because that they weren't really good enough to um, withstand the heat. They made them rather like children do at school by coiling clay and smoothing the edges and letting them dry in the sun. Well, that was okay up to a point, uh, but as I say, not withstanding intense heat. So they would have them at the side of the fire, full of water, bits of meat, fish, cereal, whatever they wanted to cook in them, and then by heat transference, the hot stones taken from the fire, popped in the water, would warm the water, if not boil it, and gradually the food could be fully cooked or parboiled. And I think here the concept of time is difficult to get hold of, because obviously time had quite a different meaning than, to them than it, did to, it does to us. They were probably more aware of the passing of the seasons than of day-to-day -day life as we are. And it certainly wasn't a question of dinner on the table at six or else from dad. And, um, you know, probably it was someone's job to just to look after the food and cooking all day and when it was ready they ate. And it was different from having it raw or having it charred by being placed directly on the fire. So it gave them a bit of a difference in their um, menu. And um, then this is a core. Um, the flint nothing was done by taking a big stone, fracturing it in two, turning it that way and with leather over the knee or a pad of grasses or something by striking it with another stone uh, flakes would fall away and obviously first of all they'd be very big and then gradually they'd get down to this size and this has been discarded because by the time the flakes are falling away they're too small to be picked up and reworked into the smaller tools so that's literally the throwaway core bit and um, someone might like to have a look at that. Um, This is an interesting tool, specifically designed, we, um, known as thumbnail scrapers. You put your thumb on the fat part and two fingers at the back to tension it. And this was for cleaning hides. They probably had, a, not many people in modern life have seen a freshly killed animal and realised what has to be cleared away inside. You take off your meat, but then you've got a load of blubber and fat and stuff, at least on cows, which we had here, I've seen a load of stuff to come away. So they probably had a good old slash with a big tool, something like this. But when they were getting closer to the hide, they didn't want to spoil it, and it was a valuable part of the economy. So they had invented this little number. Um, he turns on his axis very neatly, very flexible. If you slip, there's nothing that's going to cut you because it's got that rounded edge, and there's no large surface that will score through the hide if you happen to slip on the fat. If you had something like this, which reason would tell you would be a quicker job, you're going to give yourself a nasty gash, you can score through the uh, hide, and it's not very flexible for getting in and out the wrinkles of a newly killed animal. So this was really quite a, a useful thing. If anyone cares to go like that, I'll slip this in and they can... You can use that rounded back there for, for cleaning the actual pond. And mm. um, then there are some interesting, there are fragments of little tiny tools here, and uh, I can't really say what they were used for, but they have all been worked to some degree. One with a very flamboyant twist that might have been for some sort of scraping, and um, another leaf shaped arrow tip there. Um, they weren't necessarily pointed as we. And, and, Hinged as uh, sort of flanged as we expect a red Indian arrow to be. Um, another group here, two little arrow tips there, and the size tells you immediately that it wasn't big creatures that they were looking at. It wasn't a question of being brave and going out and fighting something your own size. They were quite happy to wait for small birds and mammals and so on to go by, uh, fish in the river, uh, to get their food. This one here has been, got a very rough edge, it's called retouched or reworked and that means that it's, it's been a favourite, someone's picked it up and uh, kept resharpening, reworking it because it, it may be their lucky talisman or something. This one here, uh, has anybody got the core at the moment? Yeah. Uh, 
Anybody got the call? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. People always say to me, well, how do you know that's being worked by man? But here's an interesting little example to show how you can accustom your eyes. When they were taking pieces from a core, very often the flake had a little foot left on it. And this one here corresponds to that there. That bit there. Can you see? Um, it's still got a little foot left on it that hasn't been nipped off. Did you have, could you see that? This little bit here. See, it corresponds to that little foot that's always been left there. Um, it hasn't been nipped off. Mm. So those are quite interesting to have a look at. They're all showing signs of being worked. And then, geologically, there are some interesting ones here. Uh, this is a borer of rose quartz, so that yeah. takes us either down to Cornwall or the Channel Isles. And this one is a blade of jasper, so once again, that's either Cornwall, the Channel Isles, or else perhaps up to the Midlands. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we have right across the foothills here, what is the, probably the first road in England, the Pilgrim's Way. So by trade and gift and barter, pieces were coming into uh, the area from other places. There's a very nice leaf-shaped cutter there, a very big one. And um, this one here, too, has had a boring end, to, uh, so that shows that that was quite a standard thing to have two cutting edges as well as a boring end on the one tool. Mm. Yes. Um, in the first century AD, when the Romans arrived in Addington, a mound still covered the tomb here, and they always took over the inhabited sites because it was much easier than making a fresh settlement. Sorry. And they had happily built on the north side of the hill here, of the mound here, a little sort of shepherd's hut. And so there are two fragments of Roman pottery that I found. Any Roman enthusiast might like to look at those. And then um, this particular tomb was robbed in the medieval period, and these are a couple of 13th, 14th century pieces of pottery. One is a strap handle, it's still got thumb prints where it's been held like that, and this is um, a pierced rim of a, of a bowl, 13th, 14th century. And then we come to... I <coughs> saw some of these earth mysteries. <laughs> um, a fascinating stone. Early man, wherever, wherever he was in the world, always thought that stones with holes in them were absolutely magical because he couldn't do it himself. And this is a stone I found that's got two intersecting holes, absolutely perfect. You can look through anyone and look through the other side quite clearly. I think it's been formed by fossilised belamites. They're like uh, pencils that you, uh, that you find in the chalkland here. I think it's been two belamites that have dissolved away and eventually left these two holes. But surely early man finding that would think the gods were looking after him. In places like Mexico where they found this sort of thing, they've had sometimes had stuff as if they were picked up and blown to be sort of whistles of some sort uh, if they could make a resonance obviously they, they that, once again that was even more magical um, but you could use it as a loom weight or a fishnet weight or you could um, put thongs through it and have it as a, a whip or you could uh, weight down the hides on your little shelter to keep it secure there are all sorts of things you could do that would remind you that the gods were smiling on you you were quite special you'd, you'd found the special stone well, yes, you could use it as a bonus. Yes, yes. Or even if you put stripes of leather through it and held it in your hand. So if you turn around and look this way and sort of sink at the knees a bit, you'll begin to see the outline of the long barrow. We're standing sort of right on the edge of the long barrow. Isn't it? We've come down when they were a, a, a left here. But Flinders Petrie, the archaeologist, came here at the end of the last century when he was a young man, and by sounding he could find about 70 stones that had outlined the long barrow as well as made the chamber. So if we come up here, you'll, the land rises a little or more on this side, and you, you get a better idea of the elevation of the area. And there's also the stones which, which were that's right, there. That's it. I went to school here. I know. Oh, lovely. Oh, that's a Reverend Larkin, who was well connected by marriage to all the big families in the area, was allowed to come and have a dig around, and he actually went on to found the Kent Archaeological Society. So presumably for his time, he knew quite a bit. But we don't know what it was like when he arrived here. We only know how we find it today. There are notes somewhere that he found what he called rude pottery, meaning rough texture pottery, with the, lots of bits uh, in it and so on. Um, but it's a great shame that really no sort of modern archaeological dig has been done here because really it would tell us much more 
But if you look, you can see that the stones are still all here. You, 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 you can lift up these great natural bodies of salt, of uh, earth and so on, and they dig back to show that they're much um, bigger and they're all recumbent. I know that nothing has happened since the skin was here, so I think that it's just a question of um, the prevailing wind bringing up the sand and it seeds over and then gradually it gets covered over. But of course, as, as a landowner, it's very difficult to have a road right through the middle of something like this and to preserve it. So, in the heritage, don't mind that I just leave it like this. The field board is satisfied that it's not being destroyed anymore, and perhaps in time to come, um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to give them some land in my field here, and they will be able to divert the lane and restore this long barrow into one. And I think I was high on the list until the October 87 day, and then I think I went to the bottom. The big houses had suffered so much, and the big estates needed so much doing to them, that something like this was really not worth their considering for the moment at the time being. But anyway, you might well come in the future and find that it's a bit different here, you know, a road not going through the middle of it. It's a historical fact that the gates were on the village green, but the road that led to the manor house came, and as the lady said, went on the other side of the field to the old Avenue now. When I came, this was just a little lane, one or two cars a day, a few years ago. But then we put the new little hall um, complex down there with the sports hall. So this is much more real. Unfortunately, this part of Mrs. Bygrave's talk wasn't picked up very well. She was talking about how she believed the road came to be cut through the long barrow of people people taking their normal path to work in the fields um, and then uh, gradually over the years uh, the path getting cut deeper and deeper eventually becoming a small lane and then eventually being metalled over and being turned into a road but she said she see she feels it's incredible that, uh, that even then uh, people had so little respect for this this monument that they could cut a road right through it And then move out to the landscape to do whatever their job entails. And they'd just be out and up and over, and little general comforts in the way. And gradually the centuries get down into it. And so nobody had any farms, that was where everyone would always walk, so that was where they could go. And uh, the land, far modern, it looks rather terrible, something so ancient, cutting to it. Almost with a surgical knife. But the stones here are the same type of stone, stone, the sandstone, not a granite. It weathers into these little round holes. A lot of people wonder if this is made made between this type of little round holes, natural with that type of stone. And so, once again, the mound has gone completely from this end because this is where they dug into the chamber, knowing at that period that this was where they would find anything that was on the um, One or two interesting things have happened over the years, though. Um, I had some people here, a man who was bouncing the pendulum very privately to himself, and he sat there now before he left to, to me that at that end of the chamber, where you've got to expect to get the bones from bodies buried, we do know archaeologically that very often later people tucked bodies away inside a bones because that was a very old place uh, um, and that was where they would be literally safe and sound. Um, so this would have been the early burial, you know, but maybe other bodies were left in various other parts. But incidentally to that place, so that's what this later man was here who was browsing in the ground, and I asked him to send me a copy of whatever he wrote about uh, eventually, which he did, and to my great astonishment, he had marked a cross on that side and said there are seven bodies buried here. So he felt that it definitely that there actually were bodies buried inside the other end of the body. And then quite remarkably, um, well, remarkable to me, uh, as far as the other is concerned. My husband died in April and he's actually buried on the land here. And um, a, a group came, several people came to visit and uh, they didn't want me, they had visited before so they didn't want me to talk about the stones. And as they left, the husband nudged his wife and said, the, the cat. And she said, oh, as I was out by the stones, we were um, talking about the stones. She said, I saw a whole great cat go walking by and as I bent down to touch it, it just disappeared. Now only my family would know that my husband had buried his favourite old grey tabby cat that looked like a bit of old carpet walking by, out by the stones. And I was very surprised by that, that she had picked up this feeling that there was uh, a cat there. It was very comforting to me to think that my, my old cat was still there looking after my <laughs> husband, who had always said, bury me right in. <laughs> I wouldn't trust himself to a churchyard. <laughs> so I 
I think you know this feeling of, of, of mystery, of unusual, something quite remarkable. It's still persistent around this place, it's mm -hmm. quite different. Really. Not the least of which is, well, how did the sheer effect of getting the year, you know, come to be organised and all the rest of it? Even on, even on a perfectly normal working day scale, the sheer effort of actually managing, for instance, to get 70 stones from the hills to here. I wouldn't do it for a thousand pounds if it was up to me to organise it. It just it appear too impossible. No, not even at all. What's the uh, significance of this type? We next travelled down to Chiddingston, where Tony Wedd used to live, and this is the Chiddingston Hoth Clump, situated at the top of a, a virtual ravine of a road. Uh, a UFO was seen here, uh, and also uh, it's on one of Tony Wedd's lines running to the Seven Oaks Bypass Clump. Hoth means rock, and here we see the pub has been named after this rock. We then went to the ancient Tudor village of Chiddingston itself, now owned by the National Trust. And from here, sort out the path leading to the Chiding Stone. This is a smaller stone near the Chiding Stone, an outcrop of rock from the hillside. And this is the Chiding Stone itself, where Tony Wedd once hoped that George Adamski would come and speak to a large group of people assembled here on Chiding Day, which never actually happened, unfortunately. It's probably a natural stone. But uh, Philip Heselton uh, found by dowsing uh, some, some interesting spirals leading from it.